So I'll be the uh, first speaker as well as the moderator of the session on autolog autologous volumization. I'm going to be talking about fat grafting and I want to sort of go through some of the thoughts that I've developed over the last few years in terms of uh, my thinking and, and maybe that will impact your clinical, uh, clinical entry into this or refinements of your per performance. If you look at Sharon Stone over a period of about 20 years and ask yourself where that aging is, there's a lot that looks very much gravitational. But if you really look at her upper eyelids and brows, the brows really haven't fallen, fallen very much. In fact, one side's come down a little bit and the other side's come up a little bit. And if you look at the skin in terms of dermatocalasis, there is a little bit of descent on the right, but there's a little bit of ascent on the left. So there's very, very little change in terms of total gravity. In fact, the jawline almost looks like it's gone upwards. If you take a, sort of a narrower time frame, about five years from the early to late 30s, you look very carefully and sort of rotate the image slightly, you can see that there's actually just more bone exposure around the eyes, the cheeks, and the chin that gives away some of that cha those changes from the early to late 30s. So easy model that I use to communicate with my patients about aging is a glass of water that empties. And what's interesting Sometimes we just have even almost too much space from birth till death. And if you ask a lot of women when they thought they looked the best, they oftentimes don't say 20 or 25. They usually tell me 30, 32 when they pass 35 years of age. So it's this linear loss of volume that occurs. So again, too full to maybe an ideal to older and then much older. We heard a lot about triangulization in this meeting, and I want to talk about a subtle change, I'm thinking about more of an oval shape, which is the importance of the buckle in the chin area. And I think it's going to be clearer as I uh, go through this, but remember what we saw from Val's talks earlier is that this instantaneous recognition of aging, and why is that? Well, there's this facial shape that we see that instantaneously draws us to understand how old that person is. And if you look at this child, there's a very, very round face, and that continues forward into the teenage years. It's still very, very round no matter how thin the body is, and there's still a lot of robust roundness even in our early 20s. As we progress forward, there's this starting to shift into a triangulization uh, process where there's a little bit more suppression in the lower outer face, and that becomes a little bit more suppressed as we get into the late 20s, and then a little bit more suppressed as we get into the 30s. And you start to see a dominance of the lower face as it gets a little bit older, and there's an exposure of the anterior malar bone that starts to create a, a, a squaring off point, um, a highlight right across the front of the cheekbone. And it starts to masculinize and starts to become flatter. There is some dominance in the lower face, and the lower face starts to dominate. And you start seeing a complete regression of volume in the upper face with a prominence, sometimes with metabolic slowdown and weight gain of the lower face. So we always talk about you know, flipping triangles, but I'm going to talk to you about a subtle change, which is the importance of sort of blending areas in. The triangle, to me, is still too stark. So it needs a little bit of subtlety, and I, I consider the oval as a, a more of an ideal shape. I think working through some uh, different examples will become clearer for you. So creating ovals, the idea of facial balance. So it's not just the mechanical, technical aspect of fat grafting, but the artistic overlay of looking at a face and rendering it to be more attractive without making the person look different. If you look at this patient on the left, she's got very high arch bones and a very suppressed buckle zone. So if you imagine if I just filled her cheek, she would have a very ex over accentuated emptiness of her buckle area, and I don't think that necessarily is attractive. So by blending in the buckle zone, the front cheek, and not putting it out on the outer cheekbone, where she's al already too over accentuated, you can blend the face back in and create a more subtle overall oval. So the reason most of my, uh, my views are frontal views, that's how we interact with each other. And so this is where I want you to see the change in terms of overall volume shapes. This is a very subtle buckle at addition. I did a little bit of upper eyelid, did some plasma skin resurfacing, and a fat transfer. But what you're seeing is that by bringing the volume into the central cheek primarily, not too much in the outer cheek, I didn't get a great result in the chin, but you can still see a very nice change to the jawline and a little bit in the buckle zone, you get this nice balance where the face just doesn't have any abrupt transition points. So we talked a lot about light. I want to sort of fixate more about how fat grafting really changes the way that we interact with the face. Now obviously, this is not what you want to look like. And the goal is to say then, when, what kind of light situations are, do we encounter on a daily basis? And I would like to argue that unless you're in Neiman Marcus dressing room, you're almost always encountered with some degree of top-down light whether it's indoors or outdoors. And if you think about that, 
then the more deflated you are, the more accentuation those shadows are. So if, if you really want to understand how light reflects on the face, you must understand top-down light. And that's really almost all real-world scenarios. So when I take my photos, there is no flash, because the flash absorbs all that light that's there, and it's not a real-world situation, if not, not if you're talking about volume. And so if you think about just pulling back on the skin, yes, it tightens things, but it doesn't help create the light reflexes when there's a convexity in the way that light arcs across the face. So you sort of have to see it from that perspective. You know, obviously you've seen a lot of long-term results, so I think this is probably not as controversial as it was maybe a few years ago. But I really started to think about it, um, why does fat last? Is it, is it just this sort of bio-inert substance being placed into the face? And I would posit not at all. And I do a lot of hair restoration in my practice, and I started to think about it when I was sitting for my hair boards. I was reading uh, Walter Unger's book on hair transplantation and looking at this as a model for understanding long-term results with fat grafting. If you understand that hair transplantation takes about six months to a year to actually start to grow, the question is why? You put the thing in there. Shouldn't it just start growing about three weeks later? And the answer is, if you look at it, going through a process of inosculation into, really into neovascularization, it takes about six months to a year. So I started to look at my fat graft results, and I always encourage you to study your results and photograph it se serially and sequentially, and see where those changes occur over time. And I start to see dips and improvements. So what I see is that there is obviously early swelling that we interpret as a result, but clearly it's not. And then there's this sort of, ah, uh, okay, not so great period of time. And I've really looked at my results, and that period of time I've sort of elaborated now. Instead of saying it's just hardcore at three months, I've seen that period somewhere extend from three to nine months. And that period of time that it looks not as good, and before you go and rush to do a touch-up or a little bit of a restorative procedure, give it time, because oftentimes it improves over time, and then obviously it dips a little bit with further aging. So here's an example of a 48-year-old lady, a week out, clearly overly filled, full, you know, very, very uh, edematous. And, and because she's so empty, I think she still looks a little full at a month. But overall, the impact is still there. This is just fat grafting. And then if you see about three months, the volumes sit about right. And you say, well, OK, this is great. Is it starting to go away? And sure enough, as you look at it six months, you start to see the, the volume start to dissipate uh, in the periocular region. And you're wondering if that is a permanent phenomenon. And you just sort of wait it out. And you sort of follow it. And you see 11 months is starting to return. And you start to see that, I think that just like a hair transplant, somewhere in the, era, the, the, the period of 12 to 18 months, you see volume changes that are improving over time. So that's something to think about. So I also elaborated further. If you understand how modern hair transplantation works, it's an idea of donor dominance. The idea is moving hair from an area that's genetically not susceptible to hair loss and moving it forward, it will actually retain the characteristics of the donor hair. I really believe it's the same thing with fat grafting. So people always ask me, you know, my patients ask me, what's the biggest risk with fat grafting? And experienced hands, to me, it's weight gain. And I think it because it behaves very similar to the nature of the fat in your, in your abdomen, in your belly, your thighs, or wherever you're harvesting from. So I've noticed my patients that lose 10, 15 pounds, they actually look pretty good. I, I see very, very little loss in the results. But those that gain 20, 30 pounds, they look very inflated. And I think a huge component of that is understanding that the, na the native characteristics of the donor fat are preserved when they're placed into the face. But there's also a component of recipient dominance. I think the idea, I think, of stem cell changes, whatever those uh, elements are that occur in the face, there's an interaction with the fat and the native tissues. And I think there's some changes. If you look at this lady's nasolabial grooves, there's this almost unruffling effect occurring in that area. I don't know if that's just filling, if that's the way that light is now shining on her face differently. But there's a component that maybe that's just fat filling in that area. Um, the other idea is, you know, we talk about what stem cell things can we add to our mix to make it last longer, or how to make it look better, how to make it be more robust. And I, and I really would be careful and cautious because a face that's overfilled doesn't look good. And I would say I wouldn't overfill this face, nor would I want this face to have a little bit better take. So I have a predictability in my hands of I know how much fat I put in will create what kind of results in the long term. So when you start seeing that translation in your practice, you'll start to understand that, you know, as much hair that you put on the front of the head, that's a great for a transplant, but not necessarily the case when you're talking about fat. And I uh, wrote here, and a small plug, no pun intended, for a, a book I just came out with, Hair Restoration. And I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, uh, that's my email. Thank you.